Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Linscombe, and I'm with the USA Rice Federation. I'd like to welcome you this morning to the first of six state rice research and outlook reports. Uh, these reports are certainly being presented in a, in a different format this year than they typically are. These reports are typically given as part of the annual Rice Outlook Conference uh, in, in this about this time of year each December. We certainly want to express our appreciation for the sponsor of, of the Arkansas report, which is the first here today, which is Nutrien Ag Solutions. Uh, again, Nutrien is a, a big sponsor of, of a lot of activities within the rice industry and their support this morning is, is very much appreciated. I want to uh, make everyone aware that we do have a question and answer function at the bottom of your screen and feel free to uh, enter a question and, and we'll do our best to get it answered by, uh, by our speaker here this morning. And again, we're, we're very fortunate this morning to have a very well-known individual with, within uh, the U.S. rice industry. Dr. Jared Hartke is a rice extension specialist with the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture located at the Stuttgart uh, Rice Research and Extension Center. And uh, again, Dr. Hartke, very well known, very well respected within the Arkansas as well as U.S. rice industry. So Jared, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Linscombe. Hopefully you can hear me just fine. No problem there. And I'll go ahead and, and share my screen. Assuming it, it, it goes appropriately. One moment. As I get that sorted out as usual. Okay, can you please confirm that uh, you can see my slides, Dr. Linscombe? Looks good. Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry, always a check when we're working with multiple screens here, which one's showing up. Uh, so again, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Arkansas portion of the Research and Outlook Reports. Uh, wish we were seeing everybody in person, of course, but uh, again, here we are. So I'm uh, broadcasting live from Stuttgart, the Rice Research and Extension Center. And I'll move a little bit through the research report first and then move along into the outlook report from there. So as a little bit of a review of the 2020 season, it's, it's been an interesting, I, I guess we'll say past few years at this point, uh, the, the fall of 2018, uh, fairly infamous in the state of Arkansas for how wet that fall became and then the amount of, of rutting and field damage and, and lengthy prolonged harvest that occurred there. Uh, still remembering at this point, some rice and soybeans left in the field after the first of the year into 2019 that year, trying to get everything out. The, the, the rainfall seemingly continued throughout 2019 and you know, then we turned into 2020 and it, and it continued on from there. 2020 was more notable. Um, the, the, the frequency of the rainfall, you know, maybe not as large of events that occurred throughout the year, but the frequency of it uh, played a major role. And then really the story, certainly not just for the state of Arkansas, but certainly the other rice producing states, which I know will have their own comments on the impact there, but the hurricane season that was experienced this year was, was certainly unprecedented and, and had a tremendous impact on the production season for us. And, and certainly you can see the, the long list of, of those hurricanes or tropical systems anyway, that did impact the state of Arkansas and, and the rice growing season. So uh, from having that first one in Cristobal at the beginning of June, all the way into uh, bookending hurricanes in October, uh, both at the beginning and, and the end of the month with Delta and Zeta. So uh, been, been quite a year for, for the weather portion of it. Really even beyond that, some notable issues. Potassium deficiency is, is very much worth noting. The, the amount of, of rainfall in 2019, we did see some of that. The, the continued frequency of rainfall in 2020 continued to make that increasingly more obvious 
and even in fields that were properly soil sampled and fertilized for potassium, we still saw issues in quite a number of those fields, which again, I'm blaming a lot on the, the amount of rainfall that, that was occurred. We were dealing with a very shallow rooted crop from all the rainfall and then uh, certainly ob ob obvious difficulty with, with potassium availability uh, to the plant. Possibly driving uh, additional issues for us with Cercospora or narrow brown leaf spot. Uh, this, this was a very confusing year for, for this particular disease and the way it presented for us. Uh, many in my experience were not aware that they had an issue, either didn't know they had the, the disease at all or, or were confused and, and thought they had something else in the field. And so uh, the, the rapid dry down that occurred with this disease and a lot of times was, was not even again uh, notable as being a disease problem for many. Uh, there were also some pop-up thunderstorms throughout the flowering period. I uh, mentioned a short heat burst being some high nighttime temperatures for about a week. Uh, luckily, that was relatively short-lived, so probably didn't have a tremendous effect, but it did at least on a portion of the crop. And then the wind and rains from August on, again, largely due to, to a series of, of hurricanes or tropical storm events coming through. And so we did have a lot of things going on this year. Uh, again, every year a little bit different in, in what we're kind of hit with, and, and this year was certainly no different in 2020. Planning progress, uh, if you're looking at this slide, the yellow line is 2020. You can see the 2019 line in black, and so we were very, very close in terms of planning progress with 2019, and 2019 was notable for us uh, routinely saying that it was the slowest planning progress in about 35 years since the early 90s. Certainly, I don't have every year uh, on the slide going back that far, but that paints a good picture that we weren't, weren't much faster and actually started out even slower in 2020 than in 19. We did pick up the pace a little later on and improve, but again, still a, a very uh, mild rain-filled year that, that really impacted our ability to plant what we consider on time. If you think of April 15th, is really being uh, prime time for us to be planning. Beginning at the, the very end of March on through the middle part of April, we were still not even at 50% as you were on into May. So, so again, very much slow for us and what our intention is. From a harvest progress standpoint, similarly, the, the, the black line here being 2019 and us here in 2020, uh, with how things drug out and continuing to be mild and, and hurricanes dragging things out again, pretty slow and even slower than 2019. Uh, one thing we got in 2019, which we referred to as a late summer, really the uh, really pretty much the very end of August throughout much of September to the beginning of October, we had a, a long string of 90 degree days through that time that, that finished up a lot of the crop much more rapidly and a much more favorable condition that helped us uh, really get off and running and improve our situation. 2020 things were pretty mild and we had we had good harvest windows, but but again, not uh, not quite as fast, didn't have that late summer as we did in 2019. From an overall acreage standpoint, again, going all the way back to the 70s on this slide. So uh, obviously seeing the, the overall increase, but over the past several years, a lot of up and down for Arkansas rice acreage and in 2020 ending up with about 1.44 million acres, which was a pretty dramatic increase over 2019, up 25% uh, just in that year. Within 2019, intentions were originally quite a bit higher, but a lot of prevented planting that year. Still had prevented planting in 2020. We could have planted even more rice, uh, again, giving an opportunity to start planting uh, earlier than what we were really allowed to do. Where did we plant in Arkansas in 2020? This is usually for me just a, a nice opportunity to, to kind of remind where, where Arkansas rice production is focused. And, and for this year, counties that, that grew greater than 80,000 acres, uh, highlighted in green, uh, you can see Poinsett County, which is traditionally our, our largest rice acreage county in the state every year, and they had well over 100,000 acres just in that one county. Again, you see Lawrence, Jackson, and Cross around it. And then, uh, of course, that's in the Northeast and Upper White River area. And then down on the, the Grand Prairie, Lone Oak and Arkansas counties uh, with Prairie and Jefferson pretty close. And you see this large subset in the Northeast. So as a general reminder, 
if you can follow my mouse, uh, Interstate 40 runs along a line from Pulaski County through, through Crittenden County along that line and roughly north of that line, about two thirds of our rice production occurs in the state of Arkansas. So um, it's really two thirds above that line and roughly one third below, but you can also include the Arkansas River Valley and southwestern portions that they have an overall small total acreage. So everything larger than the eastern half of the state. Overall rice yields, um, going back to our, our records of 168 bushels per acre in 2013 and 2014, uh, we, we've been largely pretty consistent beyond the, uh, the uh, we wish we could forget 2016 year, but have been very consistent the past three or four years. And right now the current projected yield for the state is, is almost 167 bushels per acre. Uh, again, it's been a very good year. My expectation is, is that will be slightly lower than that, but it's probably not going to deviate a great deal. Might be 165 bushels per acre. Uh, again, just slightly lower than current projection, but, but may you know, officially remain very close to that number. What did we grow in Arkansas in 2020? Uh, again, this is not a fi th these aren't final numbers uh, for me put together, but, but Rice Tech Gemini 214 Clearfield Hybrid uh, overall, most widely grown cultivar in the state, followed pretty closely by XP753, conventional hybrid, which has been up there for, for a number of years in very high acres. The, the, one of the new full page hybrids, 7521, uh, again, saw a very, very substantial increase in, in this year. Diamond, a conventional variety, very high. And then certainly we see a, a pretty good drop off, but a couple of the newer, uh, both conventional and full page hybrids, 7301 and 7321, Jupiter medium grain, CLL 15, new clear field variety, uh, 745 uh, clear field hybrid, Titan medium grain, PVL01 and 02 combined for about two and a half percent. And then a uh, few clear field varieties we've had around for a while, CL 153 and 151. And again, there's, there's still a number of other things grown out there beyond that. But you can see this slide always helped me to point out when you see a lot of dashes in a lot of places, you're starting to see this, this change over to a lot of newer cultivars that, that's occurring right now. And that's going to continue to occur even into 2021 and 22 as a lot of new varieties and hybrids coming online. So a lot of change in, in what we're growing in Arkansas right now. And that's, that change is gonna continue to occur uh, seemingly at an increasingly rapid pace as we move forward. From a technology standpoint, overall, the, the yellow bars represent where we have historically been for acres of clear field technology, both varieties and hybrids. In the last three years, you can see the, the purple portion related to Provisia um, increasing slightly in acres from, from first availability and then the white portion being full page, which was first truly widely available in 2020 and saw a sizable jump. So you can see a, a very large percentage of the acreage now in some uh, herbicide technology trait package. Overall hybrid rice acres, uh, we had been relatively stable in the 40 to 50% range for quite a few years since a high of about 50% in 2012. Uh, but we've seen a substantial increase in the last few years and estimated at about 70% of the Arkansas rice acres in 2020. Uh, not a huge shock here as the past few years have trended toward, again, very, very late planting. And uh, there, there's a lot of, of reason for moving toward a hybrid the later we're forced to plant from a yield stability standpoint. Now to show a little bit of research data and to support some of our observations about what did occur in the year. So look, these are small plot research trial planting date studies, 20 plus uh, varieties and hybrids included in each one. So 2018, 2019, and 2020, the biggest thing to really show here, not so much the differences overall from one year to the other, but really just the trends that in uh, traditionally we see as is shown in 2018 and 2019, that our earliest planting dates toward the end of March and very early April are traditionally our highest yielding planting dates. And they, they usually decline for pretty gradually from there. You can see a, a pretty uh, bad time to be planting rice around May 2nd before rebound in 2018. 19 was very good through the middle of April before gradual decline. 
And for the first time that, that I'm aware of, at least going back to 2013, 2012, uh, the, the March or early April planting date was not the highest yielding planting date for us in Arkansas. Uh, it was actually the mid-April to early May. So that, that tells you a little bit about how strange the year was, largely driven by the fact that we had an abnormally warm March, uh, near record warm, but then a near record cold month of April. So a lot of rice planted in this window took a really long time to actually emerge. And we did have some vigor and stand issues associated with that, uh, again, throughout the state, not just in these studies. And uh, the, the little bit later planting dates fared a lot better, came up a lot more uniform and grew off much more rapidly. We have another planting date study we conduct at the pine tree location, which is on uh, another soil type, still silt loam, but, but representative of a lot of our rice growing soils. And we see a lot of difficulty uh, hitting maximum yields with our very early planting dates in those. Uh, we actually didn't get the very early planting dates in 2020 due to all the weather. The first semi-dry day was at that location was April 21st, and it actually rained again the very next day after we planted and, and kept us out. So again, uh, seeing some differences there that we'll continue to pursue for managing uh, planting dates in some different locations and soils. From a milling yield standpoint, always a consistent question for us about how our milling yields fare. And traditionally, uh, we've always said that the later we plant, um, again, going by the you know kind of the average environmental impact for a given year, if you go back to, to 2014, 15, 16, 17, the later we plant, the higher our head rice yields are. But the past few years, you've seen that kind of turn on its head just a little bit. With 2018, those fall conditions created a lot of infield weathering, driving milling yields down. 2019, again, you see some, some bad weather patterns that occurred to catch some of the crop in the field, but pretty stable. And again, in 2020, um, a kind of a general decline, nothing bad. Again, trying not to compare individual years too much for these research trials but within year, you can see that downward trend instead of an upward one. But, but overall has been a very good milling year this year. And from a lot of the industry reports, possibly even better than 2019, which a lot of the crop was caught in some of this pattern in 2019 that had some very low head rice yields. This is a very busy slide, uh, so I'll, I'll try to, to just briefly touch on the point. Uh, a lot of our, what we refer to as our commercial rice trials, our on-farm trials, looking at commercially available cultivars. And really what I want to point out here um, are they're, they're kind of grouped. So you've got uh, some new varieties coming online, Diamond, which has been around for a few years now, but a new uh, Nutrien Dynagro line 263L. Uh, which has looked very, very strong across all of these locations in 2020. Um, Jewel is another new release um, that, that has increased, increased blast resistance. It's not completely resistant, uh, which is pretty competitive. And then Pro Gold 1 and Pro Gold 2, two new conventional long grain varieties that, that are definitely going to be in the mix uh, with Diamond and Jewel, uh, but, but certainly a lot of interest in that new Dynagro variety to, to see what it'll do once it's on some acres this year. Uh, Clearfield variety standpoint, CLL 15 was new this year. Uh, definitely had some ups and downs given the, the difficulty of the growing season, performed very well in a lot of locations, did struggle in some others, uh, Cercospora and some potassium deficient situations definitely caused it some problems. But the new CLL 16 uh, looks like it's gonna be a nice partner to it and looks very strong. CLL 17, another uh, new one, looks very good and competitive with the other two. Uh, maybe a little less of a fit in Arkansas for, for us, but, but again, still very competitive if we can plant it early. Uh, PVL02 again looked good, but we're, uh, and, and for us, very similar in yield to what PVL01 was doing. We don't have them here in comparison this year, but overall the yields were very similar to the 01, and we're excited to see what the what the future offerings uh, from Provisia varieties will be. The 7321 and 7521 full page, um, again, don't have Gemini in here, but for previous comparison, performed very similarly yield-wise to what the, the, the Gemini Clearfield hybrid was doing performance-wise. 
And these two do swap back and forth a lot in terms of grain yield and end up with very similar averages. Uh, not showing head rice yields here, but traditionally for us, the 7521 has been having higher head rice yields than 7321. The conventional hybrid side had several new ones to look at this year. Uh, 7301 was out there on a decent number of acres to go along with 753, but we also had 7401, 7501, and 7801 to look at with 7401 and 7501 really uh, standing out in terms of you know certain locations and even looking like they can they can achieve equal or greater yield numbers than 753. So definitely some excitement there about the the new offerings and their performance here in the state of Arkansas. We traditionally do grow about 10 percent, sometimes as high as 15 percent of our acreage in medium grains. This year uh, was a notable decrease in medium grain acres, uh, which we'll touch on here again in a little bit, but from a, a variety availability standpoint, CLM04, which is a clear filled medium grain, uh, has continued to look very competitive with Jupiter and Titan. Uh, but now that Lynx has been released, it actually has shown to, to outperform Jupiter and Titan at a number of locations and come in above it. So that one's gonna be a, a nice offering uh, to, to move in there and complement. And, and we'll see possibly displaced Jupiter. They're pretty similar in maturity with Titan being much earlier. So a Lynx Titan mix could be where we're going forward there from a yield potential standpoint. Uh, Lynx, uh, you know, similar standability to Jupiter. That's probably the knock there with Titan being a better standability and earlier maturing. Uh, but each will have their pros and cons, but that's that's going to be a shift for us moving forward. I don't think we can talk about rice anymore without mentioning furrow irrigated rice, and uh, we do a county agent survey every year uh, on a lot of practices, and one of them is certainly adoption of new and different practices, and so we've included furrow irrigated rice in that survey for years. And you can see the, the white line is the percentage of our acres uh, in fur irrigated rice with the yellow bars actually being the actual acreage number on the, on the left-hand axis. Uh, and, and my current estimate is that we had about 200,000 acres of fur irrigated or row rice in 2020. Again, that number could be even higher, but that's, that's kind of my, my early estimate on how many acres we had. So definitely a continued dramatic increase, which given the, the continued success of that practice again this year, I expect it to continue to increase in adoption in 2021. Um, been a lot of work uh, through, through the agronomy and fertility programs on, on row rice nitrogen fertility. And it's just uh, without showing a lot of necessarily data here, uh, we're really driving toward uh, I think we've done 15 plus sites over the past couple of years, all on farm and focused on hybrid. At this point, we'll move to some more variety specific fertility work here moving forward. But generally speaking, uh, what we've seen is that uh, taking our normal pre-flood nitrogen rate, whatever that may be uh, for growing hybrid and basically splitting that in half. Uh, again, 50% of that at five leaf, the other 50% about 14 days later and then an extra 100 pounds of urea seven days after that uh, definitely shows a, a dramatic benefit over just uh, some kind of two-way split, generally about a, a 20 to 25 bushel per acre advantage by using that. that. That has traditionally been true for our clay soil sites, our true heavy clays, that, that this, uh, the left-hand side here, uh, that that treatment has been the best one uh, the most consistently. When we move to more of our silt loam sites, uh, really the options seem a lot more wide open. Um, using multiple 100 pound urea shots, three or four of them uh, can produce high yields. The, a two way split such as this 50%, 50% is competitive. And in some locations, just going with the full single pre-flood rate at one time has been very good. Uh, we can probably talk a lot about the, the native soil nitrogen availability in those silt loam soils and our tendency to rotate very heavily with soybean in Arkansas, again, providing us with a lot of that residual nitrogen. So we still recommend splitting it up in some way compared to flooded culture. That has a lot to do with safety and, and risk of loss 
compared to putting that shot out all up front when you're not going to put a flood on top of it to, to make it more stable. From a weed science standpoint, Dr. Tommy Butts has, has shared with us a little bit of work. White margin sedge is a newer uh, or at least emerging sedge problem in the state of Arkansas uh, beyond our, our more typical yellow nut sedge and rice flat sedge problems. White margin sedge has, has proven particularly difficult to control. And he, he looked at, at several different options for controlling this one. Uh, when he looked at it from a burn down standpoint, Roundup and Paraquat or Vermoxone were the best options, uh, really showing greater than 95% control. So, so again, a couple of very good options from a burn down standpoint. Looking at it from a pre-emergence application, um, if you look at Valero at 88% or if I can find it, uh, the, the Sharpen application. So th those are the ones that were 85% or greater control from a pre-emergence application standpoint. So still not extremely high control from a pre, but again, very good in that situation to start out ahead of the problem. And then actually from a post-emergence control standpoint, Bassagran, which we have begun to lean on again pretty heavily, uh, that, that herbicide has been around for a while, but we do use it in a lot of situations where our other sedges may be resistant to some other herbicides. That has looked very good as well as Loyant, uh, both at, at a 16 ounce rate and an eight ounce rate, but a lot of other products, again, particularly when you're talking about ALS chemistry that it seems to be fairly resistant to, uh, not seeing much activity there. Propanil can have some and sharpen a little as well, but uh, the Loyant and Bassigran being the, the best approach for, for this newly problematic sedge that, that seems to be expanding uh, in its impact in the state. Uh, beginning in the last year or two, had a couple of reports of, of issues controlling rice stink bug in the state with our, uh, with our pyrethroid insecticides, such as a lambda cyhalothrin. Uh, in this case, uh, Warrior II was looked at in, from an assay standpoint where, where collections were made in September and October of rice stink book from the field. So you can see a 1x rate only controlling 43 or 48%. You can see some pretty high rates not achieving that much. However, uh, when collections were made in June and July, a 1x rate killed nearly all of the rice stink bugs collected then. And this has been true for the past couple of years that, that within the main timing when we're typically spraying for stink bugs during that July time period, uh, we are still getting very effective control. Um, what is going on necessarily to have some of that increased, we'll say at this point, increased tolerance late is probably exposure multiple times to, to this type of uh, insecticide chemistry, but so far it does not seem to be carrying over into the subsequent season. So, so there may be a fitness factor, uh, fitness reduction in play for, for those stink bugs. So Something that will continue to be monitored uh, by, by doctors Nick Bateman, Gus Lorenz, Ben Thrash, and Neil Joshi uh, looking at that. But so far, you know, th those numbers uh, may appear more alarming than what they should be because, again, during the time when we're normally spraying, we're, we're still getting excellent control both in field trials and through collections and assays. Uh, we do have some new defoliation thresholds for armyworms in rice, and this will, will kind of go forward uh, not only for armyworms, but other defoliators as well. And a few things from, from again, Dr. Bateman and Lorenz, no treatment seems to be warranted for rice between the seedling and roughly two to three tiller stage, unless armyworms are feeding on the growing point, which can happen, particularly on some of our clay soils where the soil cracks open and they have the opportunity to, to feed all the way down to the growing point. Uh, for rice planted in May and June in the state, armyworms are going to need to be treated when defoliation exceeds 40% at five to six tillers and 20% at green ring uh, with higher yield loss observed for later plantings, which again may, may be partially due to uh, less time to recover from, from that defoliation. Um, but certainly we're still going to maintain a previous threshold that any head feeding or, or head clipping or uh, clipping of flag leaves occurs, uh, still going to need to treat there. But this will definitely shift where we are uh, from a recommendation standpoint for, for our defoliator complex, which more in more recent years has been fall armyworm. Uh, 
not adhering to its name and coming in earlier in the season, not in the fall, uh, but actually starting sometimes now in the in the in the middle of the spring. A lot of questions over the past few years for our entomologists on insecticide seed treatments and certainly on, on combinations of insecticide seed treatments. Uh, this is one slide looking at hybrid rice and this was at the Pine Tree Research Station. Um, and again, you know, a full fungicide package was used on all of these. So that wasn't in play. It was really just the insecticide portion. So you can see the average yield of the untreated check again, which did have fungicides, just no insecticide. Nipsit and Cruiser, which are our most widely used insecticide packages uh, for rice water weevil and grape Calaspis, uh, which both were present at this site. Again, they both did very well, but when you look at combinations where Dermacore or Fortenza, our diamide insecticides were added to Nipsit and Cruiser, you see a, a pretty dramatic yield increase for those. You can see that Dermacorn and Fortenza did, did pretty well on their own, equal to or above that for Nipsit and Cruiser, but you also see the combination of Nipsit and Cruiser performing very similar to Nipsit and Cruiser alone. So perhaps not much to be gained there, but adding a diamide to these may, may dramatically improve our rice water weevil and grape claspis control. And please note that, that similar, this just one data slide to show a point, but similar results have been observed uh, this, you know, talking about hybrid rice, but we've seen similar results for conventional rice and they've repeated these uh, beyond these, this small plot work, but in large block demonstrations, we're talking 10 acres or more per plot. So um, a lot of, a lot of data there to support that uh, using the combinations. Jared, before we get too far away from the topic, we do have a question. Uh, on row rice fertility, did you wait until the ground dried out completely at application? So for an excellent question. So for the initial application at, at five leaf, uh, yes, we're going for a dry soil environment in that situation. For the subsequent applications, uh, we were trying to stick more closely to the timing. So most of the time, those may have gone out on dry ground or may have gone out on damp ground, but we're always recommending using an NBPT or for example, an Agritain type product in this environment. So that, that timing of when it goes out, as long as we don't have much standing water in that situation, it, it's not going to, doesn't seem to affect much because it'll be incorporated with the next irrigation event that occurs. So our main focus is, has been with sticking with that timing and, and then getting it incorporated uh, again with the next irrigation or rainfall event. So we, we do have another question and you might address this uh, later, but what percentage of the Arkansas crop is uh, sodium chlorate used on before harvest? We estimate roughly 30 to 40% of the acres receive a sodium chlorate application that, that is very dependent on the year and the environmental conditions that occur. And, and you know, with the, with the differences in harvest equipment, and there I'm referring to uh, the difference between a, a reel or a draper head and that of a stripper header, um, that, that, that already starts a little bit of a difference in, in people's uh, tendency to use uh, a sodium chlorate product in the first place. But on average, I would say around 30% with some years it, it hitting 40% or, I, you know, it could be even slightly more, but 30 to 40% is probably a, a good neighborhood. And that's typically done as needed. Um, not on, again, not, not on every acre. So it is highly variable from year to year. And I think that will conclude the research portion uh, for me today, I will try to hop immediately over to the Outlook report. Uh, Dr. Linscombe, is that still on the correct screen and look appropriate? Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. Um, th this year, uh, I, I was tasked with, with giving both reports. Uh, typically, Scott Stiles, our extension economist, I, I task with, with giving this report. Um, he, he was unfortunately not available at this time for this year, um, but, but certainly always a, a huge help to me and, and a benefit for, for generating outlook 
expectations for the coming year. So just to move through this uh, relatively quickly, not a, not a huge amount or not near, certainly not near the number of slides I had on the, on the previous set, but our, our general expectation is for a slow decline in, in total rice acres in 2021. Uh, most of that decline I expect to be from the long grain side and as low as we dropped in medium grain acres in the 2020 season, uh, expecting an, an increase, of, we'll just say modest at this point in, in overall medium grain acres. So um, again, certainly that, that could rebound dramatically, not really certain 100% where we'll be on, on kind of the supply demand standpoint right now, but we did have a, a very large drop in medium grain acres in 2020. So could see a big rebound there. Um, the key acreage influences the long grain supply situation certainly will help to drive how far the total acres do reduce because uh, that is still the biggest driver for us. Soybean and corn competitiveness, that's certainly a huge topic for most. Roughly 75 to 80 percent of our rice acreage in Arkansas is rotated with soybean. So when we start talking about, um, as, as we are currently, or at least were last week, you know, flirting with, with $12 soybeans, uh, that starts to make things interesting. And even, even in Arkansas over the past several years, five plus years, uh, corn has become increasingly competitive and having uh, over $4 corn certainly makes things interesting there. Interesting note, uh, Arkansas County in the state of Arkansas where Stuttgart is located, which if you uh, see the sign says rice and duck capital of the world, um, at least for the state of Arkansas, you could almost argue that they're the corn capital of the state of Arkansas as they now routinely have uh, the highest corn acreage as uh, far as uh, county goes in the state. Uh, so that, that's been very interesting. Rice input costs and returns. Uh, it seems like we've seen kind of the bottom end of some of our input costs over the last year or so. And so some of those input costs may be climbing back up going from here and, and certainly the, the evolution of fur irrigated rice and what we've been able to do uh, with that system in terms of efficiency and in some ways uh, reducing costs, certainly uh, reducing or becoming more efficient in our rotational capabilities with that. Uh, that's going to continue to uh, throw a twist on how our, our acreage allots with, with competing crops. A very quick crop comparison. Again, thank you to Scott Stiles for, for helping me put this, this portion together. He, he did all the heavy lifting on this portion. Again, a very busy slide. Um, but looking at corn, uh, really the, the two main focuses for me, returns over variable costs and returns over total. Um, you know, looking at, at corn in particular uh, looks good. Cotton, very competitive. Sorghum, increasingly competitive again at this point. We'll probably see in Arkansas an increase in, in sorghum acreage next year. How high? We'll see, but that's getting very competitive. Uh, that's full page hybrid rice, conventional hybrid rice, and, and variety rice. You can see some of the yield uh, difference numbers we're using. And then soybeans. So between soybean, rice, and corn, uh, and cotton, again, not very far behind, and this using a 75% producer share. Um, and again, some of our current cash prices, which are going to be subject to change over the next several months that are going to drive a lot of things. We'll see where we go. Again, focusing on that, that rice-soybean interaction for the state using, using those current prices. And while I used 55 bushels per acre for soybean on the previous slide, using 60 here, which uh, certainly above our state average, but, but a number of growers are achieving numbers similar to that. And, and the 190, and this is focused on uh, conventional hybrid rice uh, cost and, and yield that we use. Uh, that rice has a, a pretty healthy advantage in a 100% producer share situation. As you move to an 80% share, it's very, very close, uh, certainly a lot closer between rice and soybean with rice still having a slight edge, but in a 75% producer share um, in this situation, soybean actually starts to, to take over in that situation. So if, again, if soybean prices continue to increase and go higher, uh, this, this certainly could, could get interesting in terms of what grower decisions are 
uh, for commodity. And as always, as we move into the 2021 growing season, uh, the later we're pushed back in planting, soybean has a lot more flexibility in planting date and, and still achieving uh, some pretty good yields to, to come out ahead in terms of overall profit. So we'll kind of see how things balance out. But right now, a, a much more uh, an increasingly competitive environment for soybean versus rice. Overall acres uh, for the past few years, again, I know I've shown some of this in even previous slides, but a little bit different look uh, since 2016, looking at the ups and downs of 1.5 million to 1.1 to 1.4 to 1.1 to 1.4, uh, down to um, you know, projecting around 1.35 million acres for the state of Arkansas in 2021 at this point. Um, again, it does project to be uh, a further down year, but again, some of these driving factors haven't completely fleshed themselves out yet. They typically do that in January and February, but based off of that expectation of 1.35 million acres, um, again, theoretically losing over 100,000 acres worth of medium of long grain, excuse me, um, in a modest increase in medium grain, uh, coming out to around a, a reduction of about 6% of our total acres. But again, so many factors in play uh, that, that that reduction could certainly be larger if soybean and corn prices continue to strengthen going forward. That's, that's going to be looked at very heavily. Potential game changers for the coming season, the, the uh, China's purchasing patterns at this point, uh, will there be continued significant oil seed and grain purchases as there have been? Uh, certainly a lot of excitement over, over the first shipment of, of rice there, but obviously they're, they're buying very large amounts of, of corn and soybean. So again, what will that, if that continues, what will that do to our domestic prices? But uh, when it comes to uh, South America as well, which from an export standpoint, uh, it's largely the, the U.S. and South America responsible for the, the, the major bulk, uh, the, the soybean yield expectations continue to reduce. And if that dry pattern continues there uh, and continues to be delayed, will that help to bolster those prices and, and continue to incentivize uh, the, the growing of soybeans versus rice when we're talking about um, economics and, and what's most favorable for a grower? Um, it, it doesn't doesn't take a, a, a huge amount of heavy lifting to look at uh, production costs for rice being over $600 per acre and roughly half that at around $300 per acre for soybean and a potentially higher net return for soybean uh, to see why you would want to push for some more soybean acres should that happen in that situation. So again, a lot to play out for, for Arkansas rice growers again, who also grow a very large amount of soybeans. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to, to watch that situation and see how it works out. So um, that concludes both of my uh, research and outlook reports. Um, again, uh, thanks to the, the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture for support and uh, essentially all of the, the research portion you saw earlier supported by uh, Arkansas rice growers through the Arkansas rice checkoff. And uh, Dr. Linscombe, I'll be happy to take any other questions uh, that we may have. Very good, uh, excellent report. Uh, I just want to make everyone aware that uh, if you miss part of the presentation or, or you want to come back and review part of it, it will be available probably sometime early to mid next week. All of these will be available on the uh, USA Rice uh, YouTube site, and we will make that information available in, in uh, the, the uh, Rice Daily that comes out. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody uh, receives the USA Rice Daily. And uh, Jared, I'd like to, uh, and, and again, I wanna remind everybody that we do have a question and answer uh, icon down at the bottom of the screen. If you do have a question, feel free uh, to type that in and we'll, time permitting, we'll try to get all these questions answered. Uh, but while we're waiting for additional questions to come in from our viewers, I keep hearing more and more about Circospora in Arkansas. Do you have 
a theory on perhaps why your Sacaspra issues are increasing? Well, I do <laughs> at, at this point in time. So really the, the past few years, I, uh, Dr. Linscom, the, uh, the environment through the end of 2018 and then 2019 and 2020, um, I, I spent several years in, in South Louisiana as well, and, and I can tell you that the summers have seemed, the past couple of years, have seemed a lot more Gulf Coastal than traditional upper mid-south from a temperature and rainfall standpoint. So it, it is where that, that disease is you know, typically more, more common along the, the Gulf Coastal area. Um, we've always had it around to a small degree, certainly, but, but the, the uptick or, or increase in it the past couple of years, I've primarily put on that, that the environment has been far more conducive the past two or three years. Um, anytime we've had a little bit milder and wetter year, we, we've seen a small increase in it, but then we'll go through uh, some some warmer, more typical. I don't know what a what a normal year is anymore. Somebody can tell me when we when we get to one, but uh, you know, and then we don't see any of it. And so I really think a lot of it has to do with with multiple consecutive years now of of kind of milder, very wet years. And then I'll add on to that the the clear addition of potassium deficiency issues that we're having that are very likely giving, giving that particular disease um, more room to work right at the worst time when, it, when it's traditionally worst right there um, at late boot and around heading uh, when it seems to be traditionally always take off anyway uh, when conditions are right. So seems to be a perfect storm. I really think uh, assuming that I'm correct in that, in that theory if we do get a warmer, drier year next year, I do expect to see a, a tremendous reduction in how much of it we see. But, but again, if we have another uh, mild summer and, and a fair amount of rainfall, I, I think we're certainly set up to have some continued problems with it. And uh, the, there will be some additional research conducted going forward for better managing that particular disease in the state of Arkansas, where there has traditionally been very little opportunity for us to do much work on it because it's never showed up uh, consistently at all. So if you could comment a little bit, you and I have had the conversation about when this disease comes in uh, near heading, how it, it can be mistaken for a rotten neck blast. Do you wanna make a comment on that or so? Certainly. So we, you know, by, by the name of it, uh, narrow brown leaf spot, we, you know, mo most of what you'll see in, in most of our publications and things is that that small narrow brown lesion uh, between the leaf veins. And that's what I think most traditionally expect to see. What we've seen more of, and some of this may have to do with, with host plant resistance within a lot of our germplasm out there right now, uh, hard to say, but those lesions are forming very rapidly and coalescing into what looks like uh, a general leaf dry down pattern. Um, again, that's kind of hiding that it's actually Cercospora and narrow brown leaf spot. And so not only on the leaves, but getting on that leaf sheath area around the collar and infecting and, and you'll get that uh, it's sort of a rotten neck appearance that it can infect that node, but instead of getting an ashy gray appearance, um, it, it's just more of a deadened type of kind of tannish um, to, to turning black potentially when saprophytic fungi take over, but, but kind of a, a tanner dying out and, and not having that ashy gray blast appearance. And then, it, you know, it's also occurring on the panicle uh, kernels and rachis itself and drying down and killing those off. But yeah, a lot of confusion uh, just from a general appearance. Hey, this looks like blast. And we get the samples in or I get a picture and go, no, no, that, that's not. You're, you're missing some of the, the very typical blast symptomology. And we've certainly gone to uh, Dr. Yeshi Wamishi and myself, gone to a great deal of effort uh, to look at uh, a large number of those fields and receive samples of a large number to verify, yes, there's no blast in here. This is all Cercospora. And um, again, it's been across the board, hybrids, varieties, everything. There's certainly some differences 
in cultivars out there, but everything seems to be susceptible to a degree. And a lot of the, while we did have an overall very good yielding year with some reporting record yields, uh, for their farms, some reporting record yields the wrong way. Um, but even some of the, the folks that said, yeah, you know, uh, I did the same as my three-year average. It was a very good year, but had a very wide swing from, from lower yields to higher yields to end up at that average. In a lot of situations, it did appear that Sir Cosper was in play and was, was knocking off a decent amount of yield in some of those planting dates. So um, again, looking very closely at anything odd in the field and on the plants will continue to be important. So anything that looks like a, a rapid dry down or senescence, um, we can't assume that it's that it's blast or or even something you know normal. We're gonna have to continue to look at it closer to, to see how bad the, the cercospray is and continues to be. So Doc, Dr. Hartke, we very much appreciate your excellent presentation this morning. Very, very informative. Again, we do want to uh, thank our sponsor for the Arkansas Research and Outlook Reports, uh, Nutrient Ag Solutions. Would like to remind everyone that in about one hour uh, at 10 a.m., we will have the uh, Louisiana report. So. With that, again, thank everyone for attending the presentation. And again, Jared, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Linscombe.